Hello, everyone. Welcome to the TZM Global Radio Show. This is Bakari Pace. Uh, the file that uh, that I had recorded my original radio show on was corrupted. So I'm right now walking down the street in New York City, heading to the Princeton Club to meet actually with uh, Dr. Martin Levison again. I'm meeting him for uh, th- to deal with the book, uh, my book, actually, uh, which is called Enough for All Forever. You can actually find out more details about my book on the TZM Global uh, Facebook page there is a YouTube interview that I did with a with a longtime supporter of Buckminster Fuller um, a systems thinker uh, a very intelligent man who's somewhere in his 70s or 80s right now um, very intelligent guy he's been on uh, he's been doing public access television for the last 40 50 years and he seeks of it he thinks of it as being a great equalizer and a great way to bring information to the public and his uh, his name is Harold Channer that's Harold Channer with uh, C H A N N E R um so Harold Channer which is a big big fan of Buckminster Fuller invited me to the show we actually did uh, an hour long interview and in that interview you can hear a lot of stuff that I think is very very important for people to know and also it'll be stuff that you can uh, reach out and learn more about by simply going inside of the book when it's finished uh, which should be finished by about the end of the year so one of the things that I talk about is the bibliography for a resource based economy um, going back to early uh, economic thinkers like Frederick Sadi who a name which has probably never been mentioned on an Atesian broadcast or uh, in any of our literature, but a very, very instrumental person in the developing of the idea, which is now called a resource-based economy. Um, I talked about the physiocrats. Um, these are very early, early thinkers about how we connect our economic process to principles of sustainability, such as thermodynamic principles um, and uh, ecological principles. And this um, that actually has an offshoot, uh, which is developed. So you have resource-based economy, which is uh, rec- resource-based economics, which developed out of that. And then you also have things like biophysical economics that developed out of that. Institutional um, economics, which is Thorstein Veblen's concept. You have, uh, what's that? We say you have biophysical economics, which is a very important school of thought. If you want to learn more about that, you can Google that and look for a professor. His name is Charles Hall. He's at uh, the... Uh, State University of New York, biophysical economics. If you get a chance to listen to his lecture, you'll hear uh, just an overwhelming amount of parallel in terms of what resource-based economics is and what biophysical economics is. Also, uh, ecological economics, which also has an extreme amount of overlap with uh, what a resource-based economy is. Uh, Many of these uh, still deal with price systems, of course, but um, understand that many of these structures, uh, many of these institutions, these schools are realizing that to make a dramatic shift um, outside of the price system, which is what is called for without a doubt, um, it's still also important to realize that transitional steps are necessary. And some of these involve uh, making sure that the environment is sustainable for the, for the life of for, for that transition, which is where ecological economics is coming in, which is where biophysical economics is coming in, and which is where my guest, Bill McKibben, have been fighting for the last, well, actually, literally since the year I was born, has been fighting to make sure that this is, uh, uh, this is, this is sustained. So uh, one of the things that I think is really important for people to start to realize in the movement in terms of how we can position ourselves to start to see some real change, especially as we're coming up to such an educational day like Zeitgeist Day, is to really realize who you have as allies who are in terms of parallel values. There's other organizations, like for instance, when I reached out to members of ecological economics, uh, as I'm reaching out to people in the biophysical economic structures, these uh, institutions share values with me, so I'm able to uh, have, a, have a coherent conversation. So uh, I want you to get an opportunity, listen to Bill McKibben, 
find those parallel values, find those shared values, and let's start uh, coalition building and reaching out to uh, organizations and people. Uh, and let's continue this process for the movement. I'm here uh, actually over the phone with a powerful member of the climate change movement, one of the founders of the of this entire thing that we're seeing. It's his first book, uh, The End of Nature, actually was the first ever book published regarding climate change and the problems with climate change and what was going to uh, be coming up. And in some ways, it's been prophetic. We've seen a lot of the developments of uh, what what he was expecting, what he saw that was going to come in that book actually mature itself in, in, in sort of a, a disastrous way uh, in the United States and worldwide. Um, so this is Bill McKibben, and welcome to the show, sir. Well, what a pleasure to be with you, Picard. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what your biography is, uh, some, uh, introduce, how did you become aware of the climate change problems? Have you always been an environmentalist? Uh, what brought you into it? You know, I wasn't really always an environmentalist. Uh, I've been a journalist all my life mm -hmm. and then, uh, a, a sort of science writer. And when I was still a fairly young man, uh, in my late twenties, uh, which would have been in the late 1980s. I wrote this book, The End of Nature, which, as you say, was the first account for a general audience of, of what we then called the greenhouse effect and what we would now call global warming or climate change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, as a reporter and a writer, I kind of realized that this was the most important story of our time. And, and so I stuck with it. This is by far the biggest thing that human beings have ever done, you know. Uh, uh, alter the atmosphere in such a way that the climate is changing. Mm -hmm. And so having written that book, I, I kept working on it, but then at a certain point, um, I noticed that we weren't changing as quickly as we needed to change. So I also kind of branched out into more sort of activism, mm -hmm. and really that's what I spend an awful lot of my time on now. Um, in your activism, were was that in the, in the, in the early part of your decision to get towards the environmentalist movement? Like, was that what? was that in the founding? Did you see activism as being the way no, that you would see change? No, it didn't come right away from me. Okay. Uh, I thought my job was to write about these things mm -hmm. and that people would read my books and then they'd change and we'd be all set. Mm -hmm. um, but it turns out that's not really how it works. I mean, a lot of people did read my books, but it's hard to change because the structures and systems that we have uh, make change hard. And in particular, you know, the, the fossil fuel industry is so rich mm -hmm. and so able to influence our political life that they've been able to keep those structures from changing. Mm -hmm. They're the only industry that's allowed to pour their waste out for free. They can just put the carbon into the atmosphere with no price. And that's why it's so hard for things like sun and wind and whatever to, to get a level playing field. So um, some years ago, Really, I think after a, a trip to uh, Bangladesh, where I watched a lot of people dying from dengue fever, the very rapidly spreading mosquito-borne disease that's mm -hmm. you know, caused by our, our warmer, wetter world, as I watched that, I, I, began to, um, I began to think it was time to do more than right, and came back home and working mostly with young people, almost entirely with young people, started what became this group, 350.org, the biggest uh, climate change campaign in the world. Uh, it takes its strange name from uh, what the scientists tell us is the most carbon dioxide we could safely have in the atmosphere without overheating, 350 parts per million, which is a, a number, sadly, we're already well past. It's about 395 parts per million. Wow in the atmosphere now, and that's why, you know, the Arctic is melting, it's why America just had its hottest year ever, it's why sea levels are rising, um, it's why we're in uh, a world of hurt. And, uh, you know, we took that name, it's not the 350.org, not the most dynamic name in the world, but we took it because we knew we wanted to work globally. Mm -hmm. And so we figured numbers were better than words for mm -hmm. crossing, you know, Arabic numerals work pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, that's what we've done. Um, and we actually have worked everywhere. Uh, uh, every country except North Korea now. I think we've held about 20,000 demonstrations in 191 countries. Mm -hmm. See, uh, one of the fascinating things about 350 
is that it's global. It's not something that's been sort of isolated to America. And, you know, you get a lot of people when we think about environmentalism or we think about the, the, the consequences of climate change uh, and then when we think about the people who are, pro- who are promoting this, it's mostly what colloquially people say, rich white people that are concerned about this. But that's not really been the case, especially when you look at 350.org. No, oddly, we, I mean, I spent my life having people tell me that environmentalism was just something that rich white people did when they had no other problems to deal with. I mean, if you worried where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist and things. The minute that we um, set to work on our first global day of action, uh, when we had 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries, as people sent in pictures by the thousands to our Flickr account, we quickly realized that most of the people that we were working with around the world were poor and black and brown and Asian and young, Mm -hmm. which shouldn't have come as a huge surprise because that's what most of the world is made up of, you know? Mm -hmm. And and what do you know? They're every bit as worried about the future as anybody else, maybe more so because in a lot of those places, the future bears down pretty hard on you. I mean, I'm sitting here right now in my office just looking at a poster of the first demonstration from that uh, first big day of action in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, where our organizers were an 18-year-old girl and her 17-year-old sister, and they organized 15,000 young people out into the streets of Addis Ababa, uh, you know, to chant 350 and demand action on climate change in that drought-stricken country. That's, this is actually pretty fascinating for me, just to hear how activism has been taking root in other places. The Zeitgeist Movement identifies itself as an activist organization, and it's been taking its stance um, primarily in an intellectual sphere. But there is um, an importance, especially when you're dealing with structures um, that are financially backed, well financially backed, um, to see groundwork action, groundwork happen. How did, how did 350 develop its groundwork action plan? How did it become such an active, active, active <laughs> well, activist organization. you know, we just, we didn't know we couldn't, so we just went out and did. Mm-hmm. Um, we found people all over the world. In most parts of the world, there may not be a sort of category called environmentalist. Yeah. But there's always someone who's working on hunger and development and war and peace and women's rights and really all the things that you can't much have on a, on a degrading planet. So those were our natural allies, and and we found them everywhere. And our kind of activism is very, I think you would call it, open source activism. Mm. We're very open to the idea that there should be, everybody should get to play a role, you know. Um, And we have very, uh, you know, we we don't worry about uh, unbelievable detail, uh, but, but we're very proud of the fact that all over the world, people have no trouble understanding the science. I mm-hmm. mean, the, that 350 number, uh, uh, you don't have to know absolutely everything. You have to know that that's how much we could safely have, and we have more. And that's not you know, a very difficult concept, and people around the world understand it. Can you talk a little bit about what the science of climate change is, what has been proven, and not just the science, but also the history of it? So there was an origin story for people who woke up and said, there's a problem here. So really, people have, the the, the very first scientists to worry about climate change did so at the end of the 19th century. The great Swedish chemist Arrhenius uh, published the first paper about it. And the odd thing is his sort of of back-of-the-envelope paper and pencil calculations are remarkably close to what the supercomputers are telling us to expect now. Mm -hmm. Um, As the 20th century wore on, people didn't pay much attention until really the the later part of the 1980s when our computing power was great enough to begin running these large climate models. And as those models ran, they started predicting pretty dire things, that as we burned more coal and gas and oil, and hence put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, uh, the atmosphere would begin to trap more heat, and the temperature would begin to rise. And that's exactly what's happened. So far, human beings have increased the temperature of the Earth about one degree Celsius, which doesn't sound like that much, but it's actually a lot. It's enough, as I say, to have melted the Arctic 
The oceans are 30% more acidic. The atmosphere is about 5% wetter because warm air holds more water vapor than cold. Mm -hmm. And that's why flood and drought is on the increase. Mm -hmm. And of course, the dangerous part, Bakari, is that um, that one degree, the same scientists who told us that would happen correctly, mm -hmm. Now tell us that unless we get our act together very fast, that one degree will be four or five degrees before this century is out. And if that happens, uh, you know, most predictions are that we really won't be able to have civilizations like the one we have now. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the biggest test human beings are run into, and it will be interesting mm -hmm. uh, to see if we're able to rise to it or not. A lot of the opponents of climate change. Some of them come from an economic standpoint. They say, hey, and, and, and I guess to some degree, sort of a moral standpoint, I guess. And they say, hey, the United States has been um, developing and they've gotten all the way till they got to this point where they were a superpower, X, Y, Z. And now they're looking at the developed nations and saying, hey, you guys can't develop off of the use of oil. What is, what is, what is, the, the, pop, what is the proper um, response to that type of sure. question? Because it's a very fair point for the Chinese and the Indians and whatever to be making. Mm -hmm. It's not fair to us to just of us to just say, well, we filled the atmosphere with carbon, now you go find something else. Mm -hmm. Because these are poor countries and the cheapest thing that they could do is burn coal just like we did. Mm -hmm. um, but of course that would that would damage them as effectively as everybody else, maybe more so. They're even more vulnerable. And so what needs to happen, what would happen on a rational world is that uh, you know countries like ours that got rich burning fossil fuel would take a tiny percentage of that wealth and figure out how to transfer it mostly in the form of new renewable technology from north to south mm -hmm. and if we did that systematically and powerfully then you know a country like india could do with energy what it did with telephones mm -hmm. they leapfrogged right past the telephone pole stage. They never got there. Instead, uh, uh, they just went straight to cell phones. Well, they should be going straight from wood fires to, to solar panels and windmills, you know, mm -hmm. and skipping the, you know, fill the air with coal smoke stage. But we're going to have to help them do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's only, you know, morally right and practically, pragmatically sensible for us to do too. How do we deal with the EROEI problems, the energy return on energy invested, for those who are just now hearing that term? Um, how do we deal with that problem when it comes to shifting from or, or uh, proposing developing nations to move away from using fossil fuels and oil um, towards um, even renewable energy when a lot of these renewable energies don't tend to have the same, um, same heights in the EROEI per perspective? Right. Well, it's true that we've really sort of had our magic fuel already. Coal yeah. and gas and oil was very good stuff, rich in BTUs, concentrated, easy to get at. It's too bad that it's wrecking the planet. Mm -hmm. So um, we're never going to have anything quite like that again, but we're going to have to figure out how to make do and maybe thrive with the alternatives, which are different. So when you're using the sun and the wind, you're right. You want to be much more careful about how much you're using. You know, you want to, efficiency and conservation become very important. But we could do a far better job with those things than we do. And then, uh, you know, there are great advantages to using these things, too. Uh, instead of the kind of centralized model that we have under fossil fuel, where we have a few big power plants with, you know, lines running out to everybody's house, instead, it's more like the internet. Everybody's got a solar panel on their roof. They're all tied into the grid, you know, uh, 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 and hence we have a kind of farmer's market in electrons, everybody putting in, everybody taking out. Mm -hmm. It's a different model, but a much more democratic one in the end, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, clearly much more stable since it doesn't overload the atmosphere with carbon. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit more about the benefits of alternative energy, especially for those who are um, those who are concerned about that, but also are concerned about the a dramatic shift from that from that oil based from an oil based coal based economy, even within the United States. Sure, I mean it won't be it won't be easy. It'll be one of the harder things we've ever had to do because fossil fuel is so dominant in our uh, 
ways of life. But, you know, as someone who lives in a solar-powered house, I can tell you that it's not uh, uh, all that uh, different from what we're used to. Mm -hmm. um, and and as we get better at it and as the grid spreads out more and things, it, will, it won't be very different at all in certain ways from what we're used to doing. As long as we're really careful about conservation and efficiency, we should still be able to be mobile and to you know, have warm homes and, and, and thing, you know, refrigerators and things that we um, value, right? Like, Does alternative energy mean that there is a decrease in the standard of living that happens for the global, for the entire population of the world, or in, more specifically even for American citizens? No, I, I think global warming means that there's a decrease in the standard of living if yes. we don't arrest it mm -hmm. very, very quickly. Nicholas Stern, the British economist, the one systematic study of the economic effects of climate change, that it be greater than the combined effects of World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression. Um, that, you know, it could be taking 20% of the GDP by centuries end. Uh, these are numbers so staggering you can't even quite begin to comprehend them. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, the most financially and economically foolish thing we could possibly do is let the planet degrade um, because it's a source of enormous wealth. Well, think of all the services that a working planet provides us, you know. Mm -hmm. um, um, and think of the uh, economic upside of using uh, sun or wind. I mean, once you put up the solar panel, uh, the rest is free. Uh, mm -hmm. Exxon hasn't figured out a way to meter the sun yet, you know. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you, you get to enjoy it. Uh, uh, I, I like watching my electric meter run the wrong way. Mm. That's very fair. I wanted to talk a bit about your book, Deep Economy. That was a very fascinating book. Can you talk a little bit about how you developed that book and what were some of the questions that you wanted people to start um, to ask after reading that book? Sure. Um, so, really I started that book because it came across an interesting piece of survey research. And it showed that uh, Americans, they, they've asked Americans every year since the end of World War II, are you happy with your life? And the percentage of Americans who said, I'm very happy with my life, peaked in 1956, mm -hmm. and it's gone downhill ever since. Now, uh, that intrigued me, because of course our standard of living has almost tripled in that time. So, you know, if the world worked the way economists said it did, then we should be somewhat happier. Um, that we're not was a kind of interesting problem for me. And and the best explanation that we can find, the place that statistics point us, is that while we've gained in possessions, we've lost dramatically in the number of sort of connections with other people that we have. Uh, as we, say, suburbanized our country and moved into big houses farther apart from each other, we just ran into each other less often. The average American has half as many close friends as the average American of 50 years ago. That's a very big change for, for us to undergo, mm -hmm. and I think explains a good deal of that dissatisfaction. So in Deep Economy, I tried to think about ways that were both environmentally sound and would start to rebuild the community a little bit. I think the classic example probably is the farmer's market, which is the, you know, the fastest growing part of our food economy. Mm -hmm. um, um, the farmer's market's ecologically sound. The five-mile tomato makes more sense than the 5,000-mile tomato, but it's also a different social experience. Mm -hmm. uh, sociologists talk call more shoppers yeah. First, first around the supermarket and then around the farmer's market. And, and they found that, on average, the shopper at the farmer's market had 10 times as many conversations per visit. Mm -hmm. Not 10% more, 10 times more. Um, it's a whole different, you know, world. And, 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 and a much, in many ways, a much more pleasant one. So uh, a part of deep economy really is about the need and the desire to begin to substitute community for consumption in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're beginning to see some of that happen. The, the number of local farmers markets and things has grown so much that the United States Department of Agriculture says for the first time in 150 years, 
the number of farms in this country is increasing, not decreasing. Mm-hmm. We're beginning to see some good movement in these directions. Let's talk a little bit about consumption, because I think consumption really defines this problem that we're seeing in American culture, but also really worldwide. It seems to me when I look at the history books that there was a time when efficiency and, um, and, and, and thrift was very dominant as a, as a value in the United States, and, and probably worldwide as well. I haven't looked into the literature as, as much, but I know in the United States that was, that was accurate. But something flipped. And, and now we're dealing with a consumption-orientated society. What are the ramifications for that, and how do we start to curb that? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, I think, our, um, I think that our society has become a sort of high-consumer society. And part of the problem is that we lose our sort of skills at community after a while. We get you know, we sort of tend to isolate ourselves more and more and more, uh, uh, spend more and more of the day looking at screens and whatever. And so anything that begins to break that down is really good. I don't think it does any good to kind of preach about community, but I do think it might do some good to uh, uh, put up institutions like farmer's markets that bring people out. Hmm. The other thing that would curb consumption, of course, to some degree, would be if we put, uh, if we made the price of fossil fuel reflect the damage that that carbon is doing in the atmosphere. Mm. And if we did that, then we would uh, uh, find ourselves changing our consumption patterns away from high energy items and things and in more benign directions. Mm. What effect does does the war industry have on this level of consumption as well? Because it seems to me all of these factors are interrelated. There doesn't seem to me anything that's that can be isolated in this. Yeah, uh, they are very interrelated. Uh, I mean, it's funny, the Defense Department's the biggest user of energy on Earth. Yeah. And of course, if you look at the places where we tend to have our wars, they're often places with a lot of uh, uh, energy uh, uh, that we're trying to protect. I remember in the early days of the Iraq War going to a demonstration where someone had a sign that said, uh, how did all our oil end up under their sand? Mm. <laughs> um, mm. So that's right. You know, these things are very related. And, you know, it would be a much more peaceful world in many ways if it was uh, run on the sun or the wind. I mean, theoretically, I suppose, a terrorist could take an interest in my solar panels mm-hmm. and he could put a ladder up against my roof and, you know, climb up there with a hammer and smash them. Mm-hmm. But if he did, it wouldn't, you know, spew deadly solar particles out into the atmosphere, Mm -hmm. and it wouldn't cause a, you know, huge problem for the whole eastern seaboard, you know. It it would be a problem for me. I'd have to fix my solar panels, but it wouldn't shut down uh, 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 commerce or, you know, uh, cause huge problems. Mm -hmm. So just, I mean, one just thinks of the, the much more secure world, and then one thinks of the very dangerous world that we create if we keep warming it up. Indeed, the Pentagon's really begun to worry about some of this kind of stuff. Hmm. So one of the things we were talking about um, was, it, we were talking about consumption, and also we were talking about alternative energies. Along with this alternative energy thing, there's so many different ways that we can use technology right now to accelerate um, the removal of the, the oil-based economies the and, and dealing with those types of detrimental um, energy sources. One of the things that has been really um, eye-opening for me was photovoltaic panels on homes and the, the construction of, and just basically the, the, the building construction in terms of homes are power plants to some degree. You can use make a home into a power plant. One of the people who has been really big and promoting this was a man named Jeremy Rifkin. And he, and I wanted to, he, I believe you quote him um, in um, your book, In the European Dream. And uh, also some of the alternative energy things that we're seeing are are being championed in the European nations as well. And considering we're, we're dealing with a, with a global movement, can you talk a little bit about like that, how um, the European models, uh, German, Germany using alternative energy, and how that can reflect on America, and how that can reflect Absolutely. on worldwide? Germany is a really interesting and inspiring story, right? Uh, 
I mean, there were days this past summer when Germany generated more than half the energy it used from solar panels within its borders. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's taken this seriously and is going to reap the profits from it. Um, and one of the ways they've done it is what, what they call a feed-in tariff, uh, a, a way to make sure that people get paid back uh, for putting these solar panels and things on their roof with fair electricity prices. Um, they each become their own little utility almost, you know, and sell back to the grid. And uh, uh, it's, it's remarkable to see. The U.S. could do some of this. Uh, it's going to mean, however, that we have to um, remove the roadblocks posed by the fossil fuel industry before we can get that kind of political change. That's why we're spending a lot of time working on things like this divestment movement in this country. Now on 234 campuses as of today, there are fights underway to get the boards of trustees to sell their fossil fuel stock, not because we think we can bankrupt Exxon, but because we think we can remove some of their social license, some of their legitimacy, mm. and, and hence some of their political power to stop change. Mm. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the, the divestment thing? I, in fact, because we were, um, I was introduced to you at your Do the Math tour, which yeah. was fin fantastic. I mean, my, my entire campus, Morehouse College, came out. Um, U University of Georgia came out. Uh, yeah. Emory came out. All of the colleges were there and representing and saying that they were going to um, um, petition their board of um, trustees, which has been happening on the campuses. It is exciting. Yeah. It is exciting. Uh, you know, and Morehouse, of course, is one of those great historic colleges in the whole country, so that would be a particular coup to uh, do it there. Um, um, this is a really interesting thing. Um, it's come up out of nowhere, and then now it's in the Nation magazine called it the largest student movement in decades the other day. Uh, I think what's going on is that, you know, young people are recognizing that Global warming looks different to someone in their 20s than it does to someone in their 70s on the board of trustees, you know? Uh, those of us who are older have a decade or two left to hang around on this planet, and, but if you're 20, you got another 60, 70 years, you know? Mm -hmm. um, those charts about the soaring temperature look a little different. And so I think they're beginning to really say uh, two things. One, to the colleges, don't pay for our education by investing in companies whose business plan guarantees we won't have a future to carry it out on, you know? Mm. And two, we want you to be consistent because every college in the country almost has talked about its sustainability initiatives and greening the campus and things. And so students are saying, we need you to be uh, uh, consistent, it, it, you know, if it, if it makes sense to have the, um, uh, 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 you know, field house or the art center operating in a good, clean, green fashion. It makes sense to have the portfolio operating the same way. Where can people who are listening in who want to be involved, because primarily the entire audience, uh, not the entire audience, but the majority of the audience that's, uh, that's listening are college-age students or, um, or, or students themselves, uh, where can they go to find more information about this divestment campaign? Because I think this is very important. They can go to gofossilfree.org, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of materials and resources there, including some that make it clear that there's no real financial cost involved mm -hmm. in doing this, that the return, the penalties for to returns are very small indeed. Mm -hmm. So um, there's lots of good resources at gofossilfree.org. Awesome. All right. I wanted to thank you very much for coming on the show, uh, Mr. McKevin. You're you're an inspiration for many and inspiration to me as well. Well, I really enjoyed it, and those are awfully good questions, and I will look forward to seeing you the next time. Absolutely. I'll talk to you soon. God bless. Take care.